Okay, we should be live, hopefully. Anyway, wasn't sure if I was even going to be able to have a stream tonight. Yesterday evening, I had a couple of nearby lightning strikes, which ended up frying most of my communications. We have fiber optic out here in the hinterlands, believe it or not. And there's a power supply for the fiber optic interface, which hooks up to the, to the uh, network which in turn, the interface runs to my phone and to my router. The lightning wiped out all four of them. My house phone burnt out the router, fried the power supply and the network interface. So I had the phone company out here replace all of their stuff, had to buy myself a new router and get myself a new phone for the house. But we got everything all squared away in time and here we are. Last week I had a comment, somebody asked, could you do a video about the handles on cast iron skillets? So, being the crowd-pleasing kind of guy that I am, that's what I decided to do. And as you can see by all the pans I got scattered around here, it's actually a pretty broad subject. A few pans, like Birmingham Stove and Range, this is an old uh, Birmingham Stove and Range Iron Mountain series, have very distinctive handles. You can pretty much tell what they are at a glance. Birmingham stove and range, the bottom side of the handle is kind of triangular cross section and the ridge runs all the way into the side of the pan and the uh, there's kind of a teardrop cutout around the hanging hole. They're real easy to spot. But most pans, most makers have changed quite a bit over the years. And it's easiest to, uh, and towards the end, well, not towards the end, but after about 1940, they started getting really similar to each other. Even some of the older ones were real similar. Volrath, this is a number three unmarked Volrath, just has a three with a little dot under it sideways, had a pretty distinctive handle, had this big ridge that ran all the way down to the hanging hole. And that's an easy way to tell if the pan is a wall wrath if you're not sure right off the bat. But, favorite, and their, their uh, bargain brand Miami had a very similar handle. You can see that ridge goes almost all the way down to the hanging hole. It has a very similar shape. One difference is a lot of favorites in Miami's had a reinforcement on the side of the pan, and uh, Volrath didn't have that. You can see on this uh, Miami, it's really prominent. You know, it's a big obvious reinforcement there. But on this best to cook in favorite, they kind of got away from it. You can see there's a bit of a reinforcement there that's been ground off, and they filled in around the edge of it a little bit. Hopefully you can kind of see there's a bit of a sharp triangular edge here and they kind of puttied that in on the on the pattern and filled most of that in. And you can see like a Volrath, it almost but not quite goes all the way to the hanging hole on it. Wagnerware, some of their very oldest pans. had a reinforcement on to a real prominent reinforcement. This is a little miniature Wagner Ware. This was made about 1898 and it still has a real prominent reinforcement on it. But a bit later on, this is a Wagner from the same time period as that, they've started to get away from it. You can see they kind of smooth that out a little bit. There's still a re obvious reinforcement there, but it's not quite as prominent. And by about, you know, the early 1900s, they did away with it all together. They left that ridge there, but they got rid of the reinforcement around it. And you can see, this looks almost like a Volrath style handle because the ridge runs just about down to the hanging hole. And it's got a real similar shape.
One brand you're going to have a hell of a time trying to figure out the handles is Wapak. This is pretty pitted and worn, but that's a Z logo, Wapak logo on that. And they had a zillion different styles of handles, especially the ones where they used other makers' uh, finished skillets as a pattern. Sometimes they would fill in. This one here, you can kind of tell there's more of a ridge here, but it's been filled in on the sides. And sometimes they would grind away and generally modify the handles a bit. But one thing I've noticed, I have a couple of packs that have a letter on the bottom of the handle. Not all of them have that, but if you see a letter on the bottom of a handle and you still can't tell what it is because it's pretty well crusty, it's a pretty good chance that's a Wapak. But like I said, other than that, trying to judge what it is by a handle when it comes to Wapaks is impossible because they use so many different styles. Even the ones that they made their own patterns and didn't copy somebody else, it's really tough to tell. Uh, let's see, there's my Wagners. I forget which one. Oh yeah. This guy, this is a, they call it a Southern Mystery Skillet. There's a lot of pans, they're unmarked. A few of them have maker's marks, little initials on them and whatnot, but they're all made to the same style. They have a raised number on the handle. Usually you find eights. They're actually a little bit smaller than most number eights, a little bit shallower, You've got real small little pour spouts on them, and they have a real big reinforcement around the handle. Nobody's quite sure who made them. Quite a few different people actually did. My theory is there was an enterprising uh, blacksmith and foundry supply company that sold this particular pattern to uh, small local foundries and blacksmiths so that they could just make their own pan because it's not terribly difficult to make a furnace to uh, melt down iron if you're a blacksmith or something like that. And there was a lot of call for locally made skillets. They made these from the late 1800s up until maybe the 1915 or so. But yeah, you don't see them very often with much markings on them, but they're a distinctive style. And that uh, big reinforcement and the raised letter on the handle is one of the tip offs to it. Let's see. Yeah, this is another kind of known unknown. They call them initial skillets. There's different maker's initials. This is an FC. But on these, on this particular one, you can see that the ridge on the bottom here has been ground down on the pattern before they made the skillet. And you see that quite often in in a lot of different makers and manufacturers like I showed you before with the uh, with the favorites. They started modifying the handles quite a bit and with the Wagners getting rid of that reinforcement. If you see a pat, if you see a skillet that has a real obvious reinforcement on like on it like that, odds are it was made before 1910. Uh, you know, there's still some that have the obvious ones like the uh, like the Miami that I showed you, but for the most part, most manufacturers got away from doing that by about 1910, 1920. Guys, later. Uh, Griswold and Erie also had quite a few different handle styles. This isn't an actual Erie, but it's a copy of a first pattern Erie. You know, the original Erie skillets that were made in the uh, 1880s. And you can see it has kind of a reinforcement up here, and it's really scooped out big in the, around the ha hanging hole. This particular one has a number eight on it. I've seen number nines, but they wanted a fortune for the damn thing, so I didn't buy it. But the real Eries didn't have the raised number there. They had the number on the uh, bottom. But there's quite a few different variations of the handle, and I have almost none of the uh, different variations, so I can't show it to you. But that's one of the ways that you can recognize what uh, period an Erie skillet was made in like this uh, chrome bladed Erie one here. This I believe is a third pattern or fourth. 
you can see there's a bit of a reinforcement in there and it's uh, been kind of lights a little too shiny. You can see it still has a trace of the reinforcement in there, but unlike the first one where it has a real distinct ridge on the bottom, it's been kind of filled in around the ridge and there's no real ridge underneath it. Now, as you get up into about 1930, uh, manufacturers got away from this style of handle, this kind of general style where there's a little bit of a of a uh, ridge that runs into the side of the pan and kind of flat around it. They tended from there to get more into uh, ones like this. It's a lot rounder and broader and it runs into the side of the skillet and then it flattens off. That gives it a much broader cross section for the uh, iron to flow in the mold into the handle. And uh, Griswold and Wagner both switched over to that style starting about 1930 or so. By 1940, they had pretty much completely gone to that style of a handle. But Griswold, towards the very end, changed their handle style one more time. This is a small logo Griswold skillet, and they made these with the small logo starting about 1940. Some of them had the older style handle like that, and there's a uh, slightly different style than this. There's the early, medium, and this is called the late groove handle, because you can see it's got this groove running down the middle of the handle. They made these the last couple of years before Griswold shut down in 1957. So this is from, you know, 1950, you know, four, five, six, seven in there somewhere. But these are right at the end of Griswold's production. And uh, they're a nice pan, you know, they're nice and light. And uh, it's kind of neat. You can put together a uh, set of the small logo skillets that have all three styles of the handle on them. Now, one other thing with Wagner Ware, I'm looking for my regular, regular Wagner Ware. Apart from this style handle and uh, the newer style handles after, you know, the mid-30s or so, Wagner's usually had, you know, a big, long, oblong hanging hole in them. But in the late 1920s, early 1930s, they made an unmarked series of pans like this. They usually just had a mold number or mold, a pattern letter rather, on the handle. Sometimes up in here there would be an X. And they had a round hanging hole in them. And you can see it's still got kind of scooped out in the back. They also made marked ones like these. Usually they were uh, nickel plated, but it's the same style of handle with a round hole in it. It just has the Wagner Ware logo on the back. This is a deep skillet chicken fryer, and this is a uh, skillet lid. They're actually a set like that. And Wagner also made long life skillets which had the same style of handle but they weren't quite as scooped out in the back this is a long life made by Wagner and in keeping with looking almost exactly the same as Griswold at the time this is a good health skillet this was made by Griswold and get these juggled around it has pretty much the identical style of handle on it so Basically, sometimes you can get a pretty good idea of what a skillet is just by looking at the handle. Cover everything I wanted. Oh yeah, the national skillets had the same style of handle as the Wagner wares did from pretty much the same period. Anyway, uh, you can get a pretty good idea sometimes of what a skillet is just by looking at the handle, even if you can't tell 
what it is exactly because it's too crusty or rusty or whatever. But for the most part, it's easiest to tell just how old it is. If it has a style of a handle like this, you know, with a big pronounced ridge, or uh, if it has a real pronounced reinforcement around it, it was probably made before about 1930. And if it has the big reinforcement, there's a good chance it was made before 1910. So that's basically what I got to say about that. I'll turn my lights off, move my camera around, go sit down and read the comments, and I'll be right back with you here. Over here, right about there. over to my chair, move my mic, yeah, that ought to work, get that off my screen so I can see what's going on, yeah, alrighty, Back here now I can go back and see what everybody's been saying I need a drink of water first uh, hi Susan Williams and Sherry Thorne Michael Horn uh, let's see Ron Thompson there you are Yeah, same storm. It's been uh, mostly in the evening. We've been having storms the last couple of days. And, uh, you know, it was pretty heavy last night about 7 o'clock. I mean, we got about an inch of hail. I mean, it there wasn't hardly any wind. It was almost dead calm, but it just poured rain and old marble-sized hail and ended up with about an inch thick pile of hail on my deck. Okay, uh, you weren't chatting. Well, you can feel free to discuss amongst yourselves. Ah. And uh, tonight I'm going to do a drawing on the YouTube, on the uh, Facebook page. You got to join the channel to uh, get onto the Facebook page because that's for channel members. I still haven't decided what I'm going to give away yet. So, yeah, well, I'll keep it for a surprise. And, uh, but I'm going to do the drawing for that tonight and, uh, announce the winner and figure out what it is I'm going to give away. I've been real busy the last week or so because we finally got some decent weather and, uh, I had a bunch of welding to do on my, uh, tractor. I had to do some low welding on the bucket and the frame that mounts the loader onto the tractor. There's a lot of wear in there and, the frame for the loader if you tried to scoop something up with the bucket there was enough slop in it you know just let the bucket ride up and over and it was really a pain but I think I got that pretty much pretty much uh straightened around might have to do a little more shaming on it but it's finally mounted solid and I think tonight after dealing with all the running around I had to do today I'm gonna have me some whiskey while I'm doing this a little glass of red bush Uh, the link to the Facebook page, if you click on the join button, it should pop up automatically. It's only $6.99 a month, and being the salesman that I am, I'll try and sell you on it. $6.99 a month, you can find that in your couch in change. But anyway, uh, yeah, Ron, you're a channel member, though, so uh, I'll put your name in the drawing anyway. You know, so it's all the channel members, and but I have to technically I have to do it on Facebook because it's screwy the way uh youtube has their giveaways for members set up 
I've never seen it actually enforced, but sure as hell, if I actually did do it on Facebook or do it on YouTube, I'd be the first one they decide to make an example of. Because I think technically, if you do it, do a drawing just for members, it means there's purchase required and legally it's considered a lottery or some damn thing where you can, uh, you can do giveaways on YouTube if you just, uh, if everybody who's watching the video or leaves a comment can enter, that's fine and dandy. But like I say, they get kind of weird about doing it, but you can do that on Facebook. You know, and you can do a drawing on your Facebook page pretty much however you want to do it. So that's where I do the drawings. Click the join button down below there, and that will uh, that'll give you the link for the uh, Facebook page. And I'll sign, let you in when you get there. Because, you know, I've had a few people request to, uh, to join the Facebook page, but they're not members. So I'm going to have to get around to declining them. Yeah, that's all work, right? Uh, anyhow, yeah, it's been been quite the deal. I got one other. I see and so I was out running around today. I got a new corn stick pan. Let me grab that. It's the. I guess right up here. Yeah. that guy that's the full-sized corn stick pan most of the ones you find are uh junior sized this is this is uh the big one here this is a wagner which ends up here you can see a crusty corn cobs gave 30 bucks for it which is about what they go for 30 or 40 bucks for the big ones when you find them you don't see the big ones very often usually they're the smaller size this is this one's actually a lodge but uh you know they're usually the smaller size and even if you don't uh make cornbread with them these things are fantastic for making hot dog buns you just take your dough you pat it down into the little compartments there and you roll over the top of it with a rolling pin to cut it out you peel off the extra dough let it rise up a bit and bake them off and they make just absolutely perfect hot dog buns. Even the smaller ones work good, but I really wanted a big one for brats and whatnot. But that's what I've been up to this week between welding and trying to get my telecommunications working again. It worked out okay though, because most of the equipment that actually got fried was, uh, the phone company's problem so i had to buy a new phone because that was my own and uh had to pay for a new router but otherwise power supply and the uh network interface you know those are four or five hundred bucks a piece for them so i got lucky on that end Had something wanted to ask and forgot. Yeah, I do that all the time. I'm lucky to manage to get through the through the through a video or through a live stream without forgetting half of what it was I was gonna say. Cause I usually just uh you know with the videos, I just go over it in my head and figure out what it is I want to talk about and go from there. I should probably actually, you know, try taking some notes or writing a script or something one of these days, but I never quite seem to get around to that. And uh, used to be whenever I'd try and write something down, I'd always get interrupted. And after about the fourth time of starting over, you just don't feel like doing it anymore. But it's finally, uh, finally warmed up enough outside I can get my electrolysis tank going outside again without having it freeze up every night. So that'll be nice and I can move my lie tank outside, get a little more room back in my kitchen. What are the most difficult makes of cast iron to find? Ah. Uh, hmm. 
even some of the uh, big manufacturers have fairly scarce types, you know, logos that they only use for a couple of years. Uh, a lot of the eerie stuff is hard to find. You know, it's, you know, pretty high demand. And when it comes up, you know, if it comes up for sale somewhere, it gets snapped up pretty quick. So it can be tough to get hold of uh, most of the eerie skillets. And uh, a lot of the gate marked, the really old uh, 1800s gate mark stuff, that's pretty scarce. And again, there's a big, uh, a big demand for that too. So that gets snapped up real quick. Those are usually the hardest ones to find. But if you're looking for, you know, one specific, you know, style of logo from a particular time, you know, there's a lot of different ones from different manufacturers where it's real easy to find a, uh, you know, to find just a, you know, basic uh, stylized logo Wagner wear. Some of the older stuff where it just says Wagner on it, those are tough to find. And uh, like the pie logo. Wagner where they only made those for a couple of years so they were real hard to find but uh you know it's hard to say what the most difficult one would be you know uh kind of the holy grail of cast iron collection is the eerie spider uh skillets they only made them for a year or two I think 1909 1908 and something around there they were an eerie skillet. They said eerie on them. In in the middle, there was a big spider in a spider web, and it said eerie across the spider's back. And uh, yeah, they're real rare. They're hugely expensive. If you actually come across one that's in good shape, there's been some of them that sold for eight or nine thousand dollars for a number eight skillet, and it was real nice shape, perfect condition. They uh, since the logo, the spider web was raised, it tended to wear. So. Uh, but this one was pretty much pristine and it sold for, like I said, eight or nine thousand dollars. And that was a few years ago with the uh, big spike in interest for uh, for cast iron, and probably ten or twelve thousand what it sells for now. And some of the other sizes of them are real rare too. So if you ever see a pan with a spider on the back, probably best to grab it if it's you know selling for less than five grand. Uh, Brenda, five, $5 from Brenda Bod Bodwin. Forgot the stuff that I forgot, so I'm okay with it. Well, thank you much for the $5, and maybe you'll remember before I get done here. Uh, sip of whiskey and a sip of water. I like water with my whiskey, but not at the same time. here I was about to say something too everybody's forgetting everything tonight I was gonna say something totally went through my head and spaced it right out um, um, um yeah and since I've uh, got a little bit of practice back into with my welding with, you know probably won't be in the next couple of weeks but the next three or four I think I'll be able to uh, to do my video on repairing cast iron you know doing a little bit of brazing a little bit of welding i got uh i got some uh nickel wire for my mig welder and that'd be good for fixing up cracks and things like that and uh i gotta get some more oxygen for my torch and i'll be able to show some brazing you know repairing cast iron isn't uh you know for most skillets it isn't really worthwhile to do it because it's expensive, and especially if you need to have somebody else do it, it gets pretty spendy. And uh, most collectors would rather have a pan that's cracked and just left alone than uh, a pan that's been, you know, cracked and somebody welded it up. And even if you do a good job of it, it'll still be worth less. And uh, but if you have a family heirloom and your idiot nephew-in-law drops your great-great-grandmother's pan and snaps the handle off of it, you can, uh, you can, uh, do, you know, if you know what you're doing or you know somebody that knows what they're doing, you can repair it and get it back in service. It won't be quite as valuable to a collector, but 
something that has a lot of sentimental value to it like that, it can be worthwhile to spend the money to fix it up and uh, still be able to use it and keep on passing it down. And it'll give you something to hang on to as you beat your idiot nephew-in-law about the head and neck with it. Uh, do I sell any fans? I'm going to start selling some here pretty soon. I'm not sure where, you know, if I'll, uh, you know, put them on eBay or what I'll do with them exactly. And, uh, you know, but I got to thin out the herd here. A lot of the stuff I have isn't really terribly valuable because, uh, at auctions and a lot of times you'll get a lot, you know, there'll be one pan that you want and three other that you don't really need. And so I got, you know, quite a few odds and ends I don't really need or have any desire for. And you know, I could probably get 10, 15, 20 bucks a piece for a lot of them, make back a little bit of money on it. Yeah, if you do, if you weld something right, the weld is actually stronger than the uh, surrounding metal. But fixing cast is hard because uh, the biggest problem is cast iron doesn't have any ductility to it. Uh, ductility is the the ability of a metal to stretch, and cast iron just doesn't. And when you weld it, the uh, molten metal expands, and as it cools, it shrinks, and it pulls on the metal around it. And if the metal around it can't stretch, it'll crack. So a lot of times if you're trying to weld up a crack in cast iron, you'll just end up making two more cracks on either side of the weld that you just made. The uh, way around that is using a, a nickel filler material, something that's 55% nickel or better, or even pure nickel, as a uh, either as a welding rod, an electrode, or a wire and a MIG welder. Because the nickel, it's usually nickel iron alloy, you know, 55% nickel, 45% iron and a couple other little odds and ends in there the uh nickel doesn't shrink as it cools well it you know it contracts with the heat but it doesn't shrink like a uh trying to weld cast iron with mild steel welding rods would and it doesn't uh you know it expands and contracts at the same rate as the iron around it so it doesn't crack the iron the problem is the uh you know, nickel welding rod and nickel wire are pretty expensive. And, uh, you know, you can braze things. The reason why you can braze cast iron is because rather than having the metal around the repair try and stretch, the brass itself will stretch. But like I said, uh, you know, from a cost point of view and a value when you're done point of view, a lot of times it's not really worth fixing a pan, but if you get into something like a wood cook stove like that, there's going to be a lot of times where you'll need to do some sort of repair on it, either brazing or welding. So I'll try my best to show how that you can do something with that because, uh, you know, you, odds are if you're going to restore an old cook stove, you're going to have to have at least one piece welded up or brazed or some kind of repair on that. Yeah, a lot of, you know, family heirlooms, especially with cast iron, they get used all the time. And, uh, Angela Tremblay, you found a segmented cornbread pan, any value to it? Uh, some, you know, they're, uh, they're still making them today. It kind of depends on what it is. There's a lot of imports. There's a Birmingham Stolman Range made one back in the 60s in a really kind of saved the company. It was a huge seller for them. And Lodge also made a copy of it. Uh, in the center of the pan, is there a hole in the center of the pan where the segments come together, Angie? Oh, I ain't worried about the spelling. I always get typos on comments. Yeah, is there a hole in the center of the pan? water go let's see if I can reach that one I got one right handy here
Not sure you'll be able to see that. See where it says cornbread. This is a Birmingham Stolven Range. You can tell because it's got a BSR handle on it. And in the center of the pan, there's no hole. Lodge made one. This is, I haven't cleaned this one up yet. Lodge made one that's just about identical to this. But right here in the center, there's a hole that goes all the way through. Now, they started making these in the early 60s. And the first ones they made were like this. They said patent pending on them. And uh, later on, they said made in the USA. And I think they said patented. I don't know if they said patented or not. But this is the older version of the Birmingham Stolven Range uh, cast iron skillet or cornbread skillet. And, uh, you know, they're not hugely valuable. They go for probably get them for about 30 40 bucks you know maybe five or ten bucks more because this is one of the older ones and the lodge ones they go for 20 or 30 and the uh like i said the older bsr you know probably 30 to 40 in there somewhere hopefully that'll answer your question angela if nothing else they're nice for making cornbread Kind of nice that I actually had that one that one within within arm's reach. And yeah, those are real popular. Like I said, there's a lot of imports, and uh I'm pretty sure Lodge is still making them today, so you can get brand new ones. But yeah, that'll be kind of fun doing that uh, welding video because I got a, I have a uh, eye with several, uh, you know, several different sizes nested into each other for my cook stove, and I got a spare one, but it's got a hole in it, so I got to fix that and weld that up. Uh, no hole. Yeah, that's uh, and doesn't have the. Uh, there I go. Does it have a ridge on the bottom of the handle that goes all the way into the side? Let's see here, Raymond. Have the Lodge pre 1960s? Yeah, they Lodge copied uh, copied the BSR one pretty quickly within a year or so. They came out with their own version, but they put the hole in it so they get around uh, get around uh, patent infringement on it. Uh, if it doesn't have the hole in it, it's more than likely the BSR one. Yeah, and, and I don't think, if I remember right, the the uh, lodge ones don't say cornbread skillet on them. They just, you know, they just, uh, or maybe they do. I can't really remember, but the hole is the big thing. Yeah, Raymond, do you have a, if you have the lodge one, does it say, does it say cornbread skillet on it or something different? Uh, just like mine. Yeah, that's that's BSR. Yeah, like I say, they go for, you know, 30, 35, 40 bucks. Kind of depends on where you are. And, uh, yeah, you know, prices vary quite a bit depending on where you are and where you get it. If you buy it online, you get end up paying shipping for it. So, you know, if you pay 25 bucks or something, then you got to figure you're going to pay 15, 20 bucks for shipping on most cast iron things. It can get to be a bit more expensive. But yeah, just like mine, yeah, that's a Birmingham Stolven Range uh, cornbread skillet. If it says patent pending on it, it was made in the early 1960s. And uh, if it says made in the USA on it, it was made after about uh, 1965 or so. Oh, uh, the Lodge ones don't. They just have a big number eight on them. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember if Lodge said cornbread skillet on them or not. 
Yeah, they're cool little pans you can make. You, know, you could probably bake some, you know, bake regular bread in that too. You can make some neat little finger sandwiches out of them for a party. Yeah, they made a six wedge and eight an eight wedge, and uh, you know, six bigger wedges if you want bigger pieces. So, or quiche, yeah, quiche would work pretty good in that. Get nice, nice uh, wedges of quiche. A number five drip drop Wagner nickel lid. Uh, I can't really tell you what's worth. Number five is a really is a pretty oddball sized lid. You don't see a lot of the smaller ones. You know, really, usually the only uh, small cast iron lids you find are made in Taiwan, and they came with a finger hut. If you ever heard of finger hut, they used to sell a lot of them in the seventies and eighties. They had a wooden handled pot with a uh, fact hang on here I've got one close at hand <laughs> they made a lot of sold a lot of sets like this you know they had wooden handles they're made in Taiwan and a lot of them came with a lid so usually most of the small lids you find are from you know from these little made in Taiwan sets they're not bad I mean they're a little bit rough some of them are god awful you know but this one here ain't too bad a little bit rough and I got it for next to nothing with a couple other things so but uh, number five Wagner nickel plated one yeah yeah that could be probably fairly expensive it was pretty scarce because uh a lot of times, a lot of uh, older cast iron lids, when I see them selling separate, you know, a lot of them are going for 40, 50, 60 bucks, you know, for, uh, you know, number eight, number nine lids in the older ones. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, you know, number five, yeah, that, you know, that can go for 60, 70 bucks, maybe. I don't, you know, I, you know, it's really hard to tell sometimes on some of the more oddball pieces but if you got a lid like that definitely hang on to it because it's pretty scarce uh handle had been broken off yeah the finger hut finger hut stuff yeah they sold all kinds of things they'd even help build your credit rating at four dollars a month for your set of whatever they were <laughs> selling you I was about to say, are they still in business? Yeah, I guess they are. I uh, came across a bailed number 14 skillet, a Griswold skillet, and saw that it had been broken off, welded up by some drunk. Yeah, I've seen, you know, some pretty ugly repairs done on different cast iron things. You know, but if it was real cheap, you know, it might have been worth getting even broke because, uh, you know, 14, size 14 skillets are pretty hard to come by. You know, if you could have got it for 20, 25 bucks, yeah, it's still been worth, definitely worth getting. You know, but they wanted 150 bucks for it, and there's, yeah, no way in hell you'd pay something for something like that for something that's been broken. Uh, Rod, you can send me a picture. Uh, I got a email account. Uh, it's themudbrooker at yahoo.com, and you can send pictures there. Or if you got a webcam, I could put the link up and you could show it to everybody. Yeah, beard is getting a little bit out of hand. I got to trim up again here. About time to cut my hair for spring. Going to start getting hot again. It's been real nice here the last week or so. I mean, it was almost 80 a couple of days ago, which is unreal for this time of year. You know, a lot of times we'll still have snow on the ground. But it's been a pretty easy spring so far. But I'm sure, you know, since it's been nice, we always get punished for nice weather in the spring. We'll get, you know, six, eight inches of snow at the end of May. Just because that's life in Wisconsin. Yeah, fried pies would be good in the... Uh, 
in that uh, cornbread skillet. I've been seeing a lot of different little pie irons. They're, uh, you know, a lot of them are made for uh, campfire cooking. They got long wire handles on them, you know, foot and a half, two foot long. And then it's kind of a clamshell cast iron deal that you can make fried pies or make like a panini sandwich or something in them. I'm going to have to grab one of them one of these days just to, uh, just to say I got one. You know, maybe kind of fun. You know, I'm just about done using the, uh, yeah, I had snow last week. Yeah, we had a little bit of snow last week too, and then it turned hot. So this time of year, I mean, you just know you're going to get snowed on at least two or three times in April. I mean, there's no getting around it. It won't stay around terribly long, but it's just enough to uh, aggravate the hell out of you and remind you that it's not really quite spring yet. Yeah, you can just email me the, the uh, picture, Ron, at uh, themudbrooker at yahoo.com and have a look at it. You know, like I said, I don't remember seeing a number five Wagner lid. I'm sure they made them, but uh, you know, yeah, it'd be probably be a pretty scarce item. You know, because like I say, most, uh, most of your lids you find are... You know, for uh, Dutch oven sized type things, either, you know, 10 or 12 inch skillet or for a Dutch oven. And that's most of the lids you find because, you know, it is kind of tough to find cast iron lids for things. And so whenever you come across one, I usually tend to grab it, you know, pretty much regardless of what it is. And uh, you don't really need a, uh, a perfectly fitting lid most of the time if you're just frying something in a skillet on the stove. You can just put a lid on it if it's a little too big and hangs over the sides or if it's a little bit too small as long as it's not sitting all the way down into the bottom you know you're just fine and dandy with that the only thing you really need a lid that fits right on is a, a dutch oven or a chicken fryer and then you want to have a lid that the right size lid for it but for most things you can get uh you can get away with one that isn't quite the right size Yeah, North Dakota's, you know, get out in there, it'll be, uh, you'll get a foot and a half of snow one day, you know, 15 degrees, and two days later, it'll be 75 and a 40 mile hour wind. Wagner lead won't spin. Okay. Uh, storms in mid 80s in Mississippi. Well, that's what you get for leaving Wisconsin. You got to put up with storms in Mississippi. Pretty soon you'll be melting in the humidity. <laughs> of course, we will too once it turns real summer up here. But uh, Michelle, good evening, Michelle McGee. I've been at this for 48 minutes. We'll give her a few more minutes and uh, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, uh, glass lids work good. And, you know, like you say, Wes, you can find them at Goodwill, you know, a dollar, two dollars, sometimes even less, you know. And uh, if you know what your measurements are, you can take a tape measure and check it. Otherwise, you, know, you can just take a chance for a buck and, uh, take it home and see what it fits if it fits anything i picked up a couple of you know great big glass lids for 65 cents a piece at a st vincent de paul and uh they fit number 10 a couple of number 10 wagnerware skillets i got just perfectly so you can't beat that and uh every now and then you know you get one that just doesn't fit anything so well it's no big deal just take the damn thing back and give it back to goodwill and they can resell it again you're only out a dollar Yeah, I see, you know, I see, uh, Angie, Angie, I see, uh, pictures of your French Bulldogs there on Facebook. I suppose I should start putting, uh, pictures of my Mastiff up. That reminds me, I got to, uh, have you ever heard of her? Her name is Christina Blackfeather. She's on YouTube here, and she's a, uh, 
she's quite an artist and she did a portrait of my mastiff he was laying on the porch with a cat sleeping on top of him so she did a nice painting of that and i gotta go pick it up from her she's over in minneapolis and uh i ordered up some apple trees from a nursery in wilson and i gotta go pick them up so i'm going to get hold of her and try and arrange so that i uh you know, arrange to meet her kind of halfway so we can both save a little money on shipping and give her a chance to get out of Twin Cities for a day. But I have to talk to her and make sure it's uh, all set up. And I might start using that for my uh, channel logo because it really turned out nice. Yeah, you grab the glass lids that might fit just because they might fit. Yeah. Well, yeah, the glass, the knob on top will get hot with the all glass ones, but you're better off getting one that is all glass because uh, if you use it in the oven, some of the uh, some of the ones with plastic knobs, the plastic isn't really oven safe. And it gets up around, you know, 350, 400 degrees, it'll melt. A lot of them are, you know, most of them are, but every once in a while you run across an oddball, you know, a cheap little glass lid with a, plastic knob that isn't really oven safe i've done that i've melted a couple of them but i've had some of them that are just perfectly fine up to 450 degrees and uh you know the plastic is just hunky dory it didn't do a damn thing to it but i've had some melt at about 350 so you know you're better off with the glass lid because even though it gets hot you just grab it with a hot pad but you don't have to worry about whether or not your uh plastic knob is going to melt Oh, you're coming up in July, Angie? Well, that's good. Maybe run into you, drink way too much alcohol. Hopefully by then you'll be walking around again, you crippled girl, you. <laughs> yeah, you only grab the all glass. I still haven't, I've seen a couple in antique shops, but, uh, but, but, uh, you know, especially in the uh, 50s and 60s, both uh, Griswold and Wagnerware made a lot of glass lids for their Dutch ovens, especially that had the uh, Wagnerware or Griswold logos right on the glass lids. So, uh, if I ever come across one of them, you know, maybe I'll luck out and find one in a Goodwill for a buck ninety-five. Yeah, you found a Wagner. Yeah, uh, a lot of the uh, lodge lids the uh the uh number eight the the uh round dutch oven lid for lodge it's got the little uh spikes on the bottom for grip tips on it if it's marked number if it's marked eight and then underneath it it says ten and a quarter those fit a lot of uh they fit most number eight wagner wear and a lot of other uh a lot of other things i got a number eight griswold dutch oven bottom and the lodge lid fits that perfectly and lodge still makes them so uh so uh, so uh it's the same size same markings on it. it's got the lodge logo on the outside now but they made pretty much the identical lid for the past 70 years and it fits a lot of things other than uh other than lodge so if you come across one of them they're definitely worth grabbing and uh like i said they still make they still make them today i think they're still back ordered they have been for the past six or eight months i know for sure maybe longer but uh you know they're definitely worthwhile is it worth using lodge yeah lodge is you know it's an excellent uh pad even the newer ones that are kind of rough you know if it's a little bit rough what you usually run into problems with is the really cheap imported ones that have a real coarse grainy sandpapery surface a lot of times you'll have problems with things sticking on that even if after you season it sometimes you can get those to work but uh you know for a beginner especially you want to stay away from those and you go with the lodge and uh even though it has that kind of pebbly texture to it it's not really that same rough coarseness and you very seldom have problems with things sticking on lodge so uh even if you uh get a brand new one that's pre-seasoned and the pre-seasoning on the lodge works good you know i just uh all you gotta do is take it home 
wash it up with soap and water. Yeah, you can use soap on cast iron. Don't panic. Just uh, wash it off with soap and water and start using it. And the first few times you use it, I recommend frying potatoes because, uh, because, uh, because potatoes will shed starch and the starch will help fill in the little pits and voids and, you know, cracks and crevices that are in the surface of cast iron. If you saw the, uh, the thumbnail for this before the video started, that's actually a microscopic photograph of the surface of cast iron and all them little ridges and grooves will get filled in with starch and that'll help trap oil, which will eventually become polymerized. You know, the oil basically turn to something like plastic, you know, not plastic, plastic, but it'll polymerize and it'll give you a, uh, you know, a surface coating and eventually that'll turn to carbon, which will turn black, you know, because seasoning is really an ongoing multi-part process. And, uh, you know, as you use it, you get build up of all the different things that help season the pan. And, uh, yeah, Lodge is a good, you know, it's inexpensive. It's a bit heavy, you know, and some people don't really like the, uh, like the rough texture. I'm not a fan of it either, but it works fine and dandy. So yeah, just go ahead with a good seasoned Lodge pan. You'll be well on your way. <laughs> yeah. I like frying potatoes that way. Just, uh, you know, especially with uh, clarified butter because it gets that little bit of a nice buttery taste to them, a little salt and pepper, and they're just fantastic. Yeah, and for the price of a lodge, you know, 20 25 bucks, you know, you can't go wrong because, uh, you know, a lot of the cheap import stuff, the same size where you can buy one for 20 bucks for a lodge, right next to it at Walmart, there's a Mainstays brand, which is a Chinese lodge knockoff for 15 yeah, it just isn't worth saving the five bucks. You're better off just getting the lodge and going with that. <laughs> yeah, the Rosie the Riveter skillet. Yeah, Lodge has done a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different designs. They got a wildlife series. And, uh, you know, they're not really rare, you know, and they're still fairly new. So they're not really hugely valuable to, for collectors. But a lot of people are starting to, uh, you know, collect the series. There's different wildlife scenes. You know, Rosie the Riveter, there's all kinds of different uh, different custom jobs. If you want Lodge to uh, make a pan with a particular logo on it, you can send them the, uh, you know, I'm not sure the exact what they need, you know, but you can send them the, the design and, uh, you know, with a certain number of minimum order. I don't know what the minimum order is. They'll make, you know, a skillet, you know, a custom made skillet with your logo on it if you want them to. Uh, for cleaning a series of cornbread, cleaning and seasoning the cornbread pan with the small pointed areas, it can be kind of tough to get into. The way I usually, uh, you know, strip down cast iron is I use a lye bath. You mix up one pound of lye for, you know, lye crystals for uh, every five gallons of water. And that works really good for getting off carbonizing and, you know, the, uh, you know, heavy black gunk on it. If you don't want to go that far, if you only got one or two things, easy off oven cleaner spray, spray it down good and heavy with that, put it in a plastic bag for a couple of days and then wash it off and that'll take the blackness off. If it's rust, you need to uh, do something a little different because lye and, and uh, oven cleaner won't take off rust. It'll just take off the uh, carbonized stuff. For that, you either put it in a 50-50 vinegar solution. It depends on how badly rusted it is. Put it in for an hour or two and see how it is. Wash it off good. And just keep repeating that until the vinegar takes the rust off. And then you season it up from there. Uh, seasoning. I've been using stuff called Easy Beasy lately. It gives a real nice base. But basically, you know, your most basic seasoning process is after you get it cleaned up, you get it down to bare iron again. And uh, all you need to do is warm it up in, this, in your oven to about 200, 250 degrees, just so it's nice and warm. And then give it a light coat of whatever kind of oil you usually cook with, you know, whether it's olive oil, you know, vegetable oil, whatever. I use clarified butter. 
give it a real light coat of oil with that, put it in the oven upside down, and uh, turn the heat up to about 400, and let it bake for an hour. Let it cool down, take it out, give it another coat of oil, do that two or three times. And uh, the reason why you turn it upside down is in this case you've got a little bit too much oil, it won't pool up on the bottom and get sticky. But you do that two or three times, and uh, after that you just start using it, and that'll really help to season it. Since you're probably not, you know, you can try and fry potatoes in a uh, cornbread skillet, and you'd probably do that. But uh, usually cornbread, you oil up good. Most people, when you make cornbread, they preheat the uh, skillet, put it in the oven, bake it at 350, get it good and hot, grease it up real good, and then you pour your batter in. And you shouldn't really have any problems with it sticking. Yeah, potato sausage egg in your lodge, nothing sticks to it now. Yeah, uh, the only thing you might have problems with the, with a newly seasoned pan is eggs. And uh, they'll probably stick the first time. The second time, they usually won't. But, uh, you know, uh, let's see, Sherry. Yeah, Sherry, you'd like to use a live bath, but you worry about how to dispose of it. Yeah, you can just pour it down your toilet. And uh, it's safe for your plumbing, and it'll take out any grease, or down your kitchen sink even. It'll help to uh, degrease your pipes. And I see Brenda now, this came up, she answered the question for me. Yeah, it'll clean out your pipes, because, yeah, uh, most drain cleaners and drain openers are, are lye-based. So, yeah, it's safe to uh, pour it down your, down your toilet, down your sink. You know, just, uh, you know, be careful while you're doing it so you don't splash it on you. You should wear rubber gloves and you should wear eye protection to keep it out of your eyes because getting a lie in your eyes is uh, pretty unpleasant. Uh, carbon graphite motor brushes to fill in pores that would work for cookware too. Hmm. It, it probably would to some degree, but it's not going to have anything to really bond it to the metal. You know, where, uh, where, uh, where, uh, when you allow an oil to carbonize and polymerize on the, uh, surface of the iron, it'll bond, you know, bond better. You know, I would think that, uh, you know, graphite, you'd probably end up shedding quite a bit of graphite. Yeah, I wouldn't, sure, I wouldn't pour it down a storm drain or a storm sewer or something like that. You know, because most of them run into rivers. And while lye will break down over time, you know, a big dose of lye in a, you know, in a creek somewhere, you end up killing fish and plants. You don't want to do that. You know, but, uh, you know, dumping it down a uh, sanitary sewer is okay. Yeah, and back to the graphite. I have had a hell of a time with uh, polishing the uh, top on my cook stove because most of your stove polishes are they're a, uh, basically a wax and graphite. In uh, nowadays, they use a water base polish, and uh, the old days they used a lot more wax. A lot it was a uh, oil and solvent based, and it had a certain amount of graphite and stove black in it or lamp black in it. And it bonded the uh, oil would help to bond the uh, lamp black to the cast iron, but with the newer polishes, they're a lot less volatile, a lot less noxious fumes, but they're water based, and the graphite doesn't bond to it. And, uh, and when I'd wipe the top of the stove off, it would just wipe that graphite right off. And I think you'd probably have the same problem trying to do it with the cast iron pan. Yeah, electrolysis is good too. I use uh Yeah, Angie, if you look on my channel, there's some I got a bunch of other little videos on there, you know, going through all the different ways of restoring cast iron, cleaning it up and reseasoning it. And that'll give give you a little more detail. Yeah, I use both a live bath and electrolysis. You can use electrolysis alone, but it takes longer. 
if you got a big build up of crud on the outside of it. So I usually strip the pans first in lye and get all that off of there. And, uh, you know, from there, go through the electrolysis because my electrolysis is kind of my biggest bottleneck in the process because I can only do one or two. Well, I got a bigger tank this year and I'm going to see if I can do two pans at once, but I can only do one pan at a time. And if you strip it first and you're just getting the rust off of the electrolysis, it goes a lot faster. I mean, I can do a couple, two or three pans a day, de-rusting them where getting all the uh, crud and rust off, it would take a day or day and a half per pan. So, uh, you know, if you got a little bit of time and you, uh, you know, or if you got a really big setup where you can do a whole bunch of things at once, just doing electrolysis alone is uh, pretty good. All I got is a fire pit. No, don't burn them in a fire pit. Because uh, that can cause heat damage. And uh, what do I do with that? I got a, got a uh, heat damaged chicken fryer. And you can really tell that it's been, it's been burnt hot. With fire pits, you can't really control the heat. And it gets overheated. And it'll... Uh, It messes up the iron. You get spots that are a lot harder, a lot more brittle than other spots that it can burn some of the carbon out of the iron and uh, hard spots, soft spots. It's, you know, it's not a good idea. Uh, you got a thick coating of too much oil. Uh, usually what you can do is you just put it back in the oven and heat it up to about 300 degrees and take it out with a hot pad and use a big rag so you don't get or an oven mitt or something like that so you don't burn yourself get it good and hot and uh wipe it down and you can usually wipe off a lot of that excess sticky stuff and uh if that doesn't work well actually you just should try just giving a good scrubbing and soap and water first that'll take most of it off if that doesn't get it all off then heat it up good and wipe it down and just do that a few times and you can usually get rid of that excess stuff pretty easily a bsr yeah those are you know worthwhile pan to try saving so yeah it's not you know it's usually not too hard getting excess oil off them just you know either either scrub it in soap and water and uh you know, after done scrubbing and soap and water, dry it on the stove and give it another little light coat of oil this time around. Or if that doesn't do it, warm it up and uh, wipe it down. Yeah, an old Taiwanese. Yeah, a lot of the uh, made in Taiwan and made in Korea skillets are actually pretty good. I mean, I've got, you know, one of my favorite pans is a little made in Taiwan skillet. And they're usually a lot better than a lot of the cheap, Chinese made stuff you know it's just kind of the way it is but yeah you know you don't have to be snobbish about cast iron I mean yeah I got a lot of really cool stuff that I've acquired over a few years but uh you know for daily use a lot of the uh you know Taiwanese and Korean and even some of the Chinese if you find one that's you know fairly decent quality is uh you know it's perfectly good for everyday cooking or taking a camping if you want to take you know, a cast iron can cast iron pan to use on the campfire, but you don't want to have something that you're going to be heartbreaking if you lose it. You know, a lot of the imported stuff is great. Uh, I would heat it up in the oven. You know, it'll heat nice and even all the way around. Yeah, heat it up to about about 300, 325 Fahrenheit should be a great plenty. You don't need it to get it smoking hot. You know, just enough to warm it up good, and that should should melt and loosen up any excess oil you got on there, you know, and just wipe it off careful with a rag, you know, you know, you know just be careful you don't burn yourself. I'm out of water. Oh, well. But I've been at this for about an hour or so. Yeah, the oven will give you a little better heating. It'll heat it up nice and even, heat all the way around. 
you know, get everything good and warm all at once. So I've been at this for a little over an hour now, so I think I'm going to wrap it up and uh, get on with some of the other things I still have to do tonight. Get my dishes put away. You can see them all piled up there behind me if you look. Get my dishes put away and round up all that cast iron I got stacked on the stove. And uh, yeah, you can send that. If you want to send that picture, like I say, uh, the mudbrooker at yahoo.com, and you should be able to email me a picture of that lid. Because yeah, I've never seen a number five Wagner lid. That'd be kind of cool to see. And uh, yeah, like I say, I don't really know about the price, but I can tell you it is you know, something that's going to be pretty scarce, so it should be fairly valuable. Uh, the next cooking video, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what I got going on the next week or so. You know, it's going to be kind of busy depending on the weather, but I want to try and get another actual cooking video out soon. I want to make croissants again because uh, I've made croissants before and uh, they're really nice, but uh, you know, it's kind of an all day affair. I mean, you can make a you can make a couple batches at once and freeze the dough, which is nice. But, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get uh, rained on here one of these days pretty soon. And hopefully I can uh, take time out to do them. A couple other things I like to make. So I should be getting another cooking video up within a week or so anyway. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to call it a day. And I'll see you all next time. I'll come up with some hopefully interesting subject for the next video to start off with and sit around and chat with you all. It's always kind of fun to chat with people. Yeah, croissants are great. I mean, it's it's not, it, you know, there's a bit of technique involved, but it's not really as hard as you think it would be to get them to come out that way. So hopefully I can show you how to, to do that. Oh, a Finex pan? Yeah, I've always wanted one of them. I haven't got one yet, but, uh, you know, I haven't been able to find a cheap enough one. And, you know, I'm too cheap to spend full price and buy a brand new one. But anyway, I will see you all later, and thank you much for watching. Remember to join my channel. If you join, you get to go onto the Facebook page, and even the members that aren't on the Facebook page, I'm going to enter you in the drawing, which I will do later tonight and probably announce it tomorrow once I figure out which... Thing I'm going to give you. I got to thin the herd around here, so I should probably do this more often. But, you know, trying to use it as an incentive to get people to join the channel because I am not above outright bribery. Anyway, thank you much, and I will see you all next week.